She's a chartered electrical and electronic engineer with first class honors degree from the University of East London. She's a member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology UK and holds an MBA from INSEAD in France. She has over two decades of corporate experience with blue chip companies starting at Ford Motor Company. She has held C-level positions for a decade at Tico Millicom, Vodafone, and Airtel. Her career spans manufacturing, telecommunications, banking, and automotive industries in Europe and Africa. She has led technical marketing and sales function before becoming CEO. She is a passionate advocate who believes in harnessing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, to advance development in Africa. She also advocates for greater participation in STEM, especially for young people across the continent. She's a recipient of multiple honors by reputable organizations for her exceptional strategic insights, delivery of transformative business results, and dedication to growing people within her organizations. Notable among these are the CIMG Marketing Woman of the Year 2014, Telecom CEO of the Year 2016, CSR CEO of the Year 2016, and the Corporate Leadership Award at the Ghana Legacy, uh, at the Ghana Legacy Awards 2017. Um, in her spare time, uh, Lucy travels the world um, and is an international speaker focusing on leadership, technology, transformative business models, and the creation of prosperity for, disadvantaged, for the disadvantaged in the world. So as you can see, these are very much themes that at the Institute for the Study of International Development and more broadly uh, through the university, uh, these are issues that we take very, uh, very seriously. And we're very excited uh, to welcome Lucy uh, to uh, give a talk at McGill. Thank you very much, and please join me in welcoming Lucy. Good evening, everyone. That's a little bit quiet. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, first of all, I want to say a very big um, thank you, particularly to you, Professor Laszlo, um, and all the faculty um, at McGill, everyone who's made today possible. Uh, most importantly, Ian, who I cannot see right now. There he is, because um, he, he absolutely made everything happen today. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you all also for making the time to be here. I would be remiss not to also say, because I know this is being recorded, happy birthday to my husband, because it's his birthday today. And I'm so far away in Canada, but he's been very sweet about it. So happy birthday when he sees us. I did not forget you. Um, it's really an honor to be here today. And I hope that um, some of the ideas that I share with you today will at least trigger some thoughts um, at the very minimum. Um, we're going to be talking about leading change from a global perspective, I guess from a perspective that me, you know, of a different background or experience. Um, I, I, I will talk a bit about some of the global structures or injustices which mean that we need to have these conversations. We'll talk a bit about diversity as well, um, inevitably, um, and we'll talk about the courage it takes to lead, because we use the word leadership a lot, but it's, it's not as easy and as simple as just saying a word. I think many of you appreciate that. Um, and then finally, we will talk a little bit about the change that we actually need. Many years ago, um, oh gosh, it must have been the 1980s for sure, um, growing up in Ghana, um, I remember having a neighbor and I can't remember her name, but I can picture her face. I know exactly what she looks like. But this particular neighbor was not from Ghana. She was a Liberian girl. And this um, young lady who was our friend that we used to play with had found her way to Ghana because there was a war in Liberia. And she had made her home in Ghana with her family. And I think she must have been probably from a sort of a, a I know, a, a stronger income, whatever background, because she was in the more built out parts of um, Accra. 
uh, the capital of Ghana. But most of the people who had fled the war in Liberia and had come to Ghana actually found themselves in a suburb of Accra called Budumbura. Uh, which wasn't um, built up at all at the time. It was, a lot of it was sort of more um, open kind of, um, I wouldn't use the word wasteland, but it was more on the outskirts of the city, so it wasn't particularly built up. But the interesting thing about Budumburam is that I say it was in the 1980s, but most of those people never left. And they still live in Budumburam, except most people don't realize that they're, they were, they're not originally from Ghana because they're a couple of generations down now and, and they're as Ghanaian as anybody else. Uh, but the fact, the, the point is that these people who were displaced through no fault of their own found their way in, into Ghana and made a home there. And I think for me, that was my... my first first-hand experience of injustice that can cut across um, countries. And it was a, a simple experience because there was nothing wrong with our friend, but I learned a lesson from, you know, sort of being her friend. And I think this and many experiences like that um, through my childhood left such an indelible um, impression on me that I cannot see myself not to, to, not thinking about how we actually change the world so that more people can live freely like I think I get to live and not have to worry about tomorrow. So I'd like to situate our conversation with some facts. I like facts because then we, we're, we're not talking emotion and conjecture, but we're, we're basing it on something real. So let me share some global um, figures with you. So according to UNDP, 11% of the world's population lives in extreme poverty. Um, I think putting the word extreme and poverty together is enough of a description to tell you how bad it can be. Um, this is way below the, the $2, um, a day, um, percent, $2 um, a day amount that is prescribed for, for poverty. Now, when we talk about dimensional poverty, that's slightly different because dimensional poverty goes beyond one metric. It's not just about um, uh, food, but it's also about healthcare and access to um, a decent means of living. And according to UNDP, 58% of um, people in sub-Saharan Africa are dimensionally poor, so it, go, it cuts across more than one metric, and it's 31% in Southeast Asia. Which are really, it's a really interesting way to look at a region because I feel that every time people hear figures like this, it almost takes away from the people the figures represent, right? If, if, if I reduce your life to a number and a figure and it's, it's based on my perception of what that figure should be, I've kind of dismissed a lot of who you are. So let's look at these two regions slightly differently then. Um, on your screens on the, on the um, right-hand side, it's estimated that the population of Southeast Asia is 1.9 billion and um, Africa is at 1.2 billion. That's a loss of people. Um, and especially in a world where we're a little over 7 billion, that's a huge chunk of the world. So I would argue that actually these regions are very rich when it comes to human population. They have a loss of human resources. If we turn our sights towards the left of your screen, we see even more interesting figures. And for me on that side, the most in, in, interesting figure I want you to remember, I do actually want you to remember this one, is 80%. 80% of the world's reserves of coltan are found in a huge country in the middle of Africa called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, it's a country that I know firsthand because I've lived there for work, so it's not just a country I've read about. And it is um, estimated that the Democratic Republic of Congo is about um, two-thirds the size of Western Europe, something like that, so it's a massive place. Um, population about 80 million, but more importantly is the, is the, the mineral coal turn. Coal tan is found in, I'm sure everybody in this room has a smartphone. High chance, right? If you don't have one, you're uh, an outline, you have very personal reasons why you don't have a smartphone. Most people have um, a smartphone. Every smartphone battery contains coltan. 
Every smart car battery contains coltan. 80% of the, of the reserves are in, in um, the DRC. It's estimated that anywhere between 60 to 70% of the devices that we hold in our hands today and we use um, have coltan from the DRC. So this then for me is a very curious equation. How does a country that has most of the coltan that's driving uh, uh, an age, which is an information age where we use these devices, supplies to this whole world remain poor. H how is that possible? There's something fundamentally wrong um, because it's not possible for a country to provide a global good for billions of people and still be poor. Or let me put it slightly differently. We all read recently that um, Apple is now valued at over a trillion dollars. It goes up and down a little bit, but it hovers around the trillion. Think about a company that's worth a trillion dollars, right, that has a mineral in the devices they sell to get, get, and they couldn't have the device without that mineral. And 60 to 70% of that mineral is from one country, and yet that country is poor. There's something fundamentally wrong here. I won't harp on about the other minerals because those are ones that most people are familiar with. The only comment I'll make on that is that, you know, very recently, this past weekend, I saw a headline that said that um, France and Italy were fighting over Libya's oil. Is there something wrong with that statement? Right? It's like two people showing up to your house um, and they're fighting over your property. And the statement almost makes it sound as though they have a right to fight over your property. There's something fundamentally wrong about how we've structured our world um, that we need to address. Now, Another thing that really um, hurts parts of our world sometimes is trade. And it's not just um, trade on the surface of it, but also the influence of trade on, our, on some of these places. So if you are in um, Ghana and most countries in Africa where I come from, you will find that over time what has happened is that most trade used to be, most trade still remains inward trade of finished goods. Um, and, and it used to be that most of, most of the trade came from um, sort of um, the US and then and, and Europe as well. And now we are seeing increasingly um, trade from China, which has been in the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years, it's been most, most dramatic. Um, but that's the sort of statement you make that's great for headlines. I think if we look at it more, we take a step back and we look at it more over a long period of time, then what's really happened um, in, in places like Africa, I'm narrowing it down, down now, is that the relationship, the trade relationship has fundamentally not changed for a few centuries. That what we see and experience and what informs those metrics of so-called poverty is, is actually being built structurally over a long time. So before many countries were, were, were colonized, we had what was, I would term, merchant capitalism. Right? The merchant comes, um, he or she is the guy who's come and discovers whatever mineral or resource or whatever they think, they take it home, they go and trade, they make a lot of money, um, and they, they build this great wealth of theirs. Um, and then it, then it moved into more sort of structured and formal capitalism when it became about large companies and large corporations. So it's not just a merchant, but it's really big, big trade. Um, and then we had sort of democracy, another import, which really didn't take, take into consideration a lot of how things happen on the ground. But everything is about inward, inward, inward. Um, and in a way, wealth kind of takes the opposite um, route out of the continent. Um, and it's been going on for a very long time. But things sometimes change in ways that are not favorable. And one of the things I have observed is that um, 
places like Africa live with uh, um, another part of the world uh, sneezes and then, you know, people in Africa have to catch a cold. And very specifically, during the financial crises of 2007 and two th to, towards 2008-ish, um, I remember so many mines um, closing down, particularly in places like the DRC which left a lot of people jobless because suddenly the argument was, well, there's a financial crisis in other parts of the world. Nobody wants these minerals, so you go home. We can't continue to, to assume that this is okay for our world. Not at all. Because when these things happen and people are either... Um, displaced or um, poor or disadvantaged and so on. We kind of find convenient ways to rephrase and repackage it that, so that it suddenly sounds like either it's their fault or, or um, there's nothing we can do about it or they're the ones really who are taking advantage of us. And we really need to sit back and relook at this. So it's estimated that half of the world's refugees are from three countries. 55% South Sudan, Afghanistan, Syria. I'm not going to bore you with the details of you know, why we have so many refugees from these countries, because you know them, just like I do. What's more important is that we're all persistently fed this rhetoric that the people who come out of these countries, we call them all kinds of names, we use different you know, unsavory words to describe them, but we also position them as people who are just coming to take away from other people. But interestingly, if you look on the right-hand side, over half of the world's refugees actually still live in Africa um, and the Middle East. They haven't gone anywhere. If you listen to, to, to the media, you would assume that there's this mass exodus out of this um, continent and everybody needs to make sure that they're safe quickly enough because everyone has left. I can assure you 1.2 billion people are not finding their way out uh, someone else. It's just physically impossible. And you know, we emphasize so much, so much of the global debate and so much of global politics now has now come to revolve around this particular issue, which is a product of a structure that we have created. We're all culpable, and yet we turn around and say, and vilify these people. So we make so much noise about refugees and people coming into Europe and the Americas, but actually, it's a third of all the movement. It's not the majority of the movement. And this is UNHCR saying it, it's not me. In fact, one of the countries that has the highest population of refugees in the world is Uganda, which most people wouldn't think of. No, most people wouldn't think of Uganda as a home for refugees. But I can imagine that Uganda, like Ghana of the 1980s, if your neighbors need somewhere to be, you're not gonna send them away. You're going to open your doors and you're going to say, whatever I have, you can have too. But unfortunately, because the media has insisted on this rhetoric of, you know, forget the, the, the structure, let's look at this outcome and it's the worst thing e ever, it's left us in a world where people feel very unsafe. They think that someone's you know, about to get them or, or, or putting their way of life at risk. And yet we sometimes forget that a lot of the time, and particularly if you look at places like Afghanistan and Libya, a lot of this displacement is actually a byproduct of foreign intervention. You know, we can't have these conversations and assume that our perspective is the only perspective that matters. We have to have the level, the, the open-mindedness to say, what if I look at this from your point of view? In fact, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a, a proverb from Ghana that I will not um, pretend to get word for word right, because I never get it right, even though I absolutely love it. But it says something about how um, until, until the, 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 the lion um, um, learns to tell its own stories, um, uh, its own story, stories of hunting will always um, glorify the hunter, 
right? Because if I'm the hunter and I'm the one who's always telling the story, I will only tell it from my perspective. And I'll never tell you how the lion felt about it because the lion's not there to tell you its story. And that's what we, we, we keep doing. We keep positioning the narrative of our existence as human beings from a, a single side and then, and then sort of flow it to the rest of the world and to say, what if it's, it's bigger than my perspective? And don't get me wrong, when I say that, I don't mean that from any one side. This is a very specific example about the intervention in wars. But when it comes to the perspective, I think each one of us stands the risk of forgetting that we cannot see the world from only our perspective. That we have to invite other perspectives in to enrich our thinking and help us make better calls and better choices and decisions as leaders. Now, this particular um, 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 example that I'm emphasizing on, on injustice that has led to people displacement has led to a completely, um, I think, unintended um, outcome. I don't think that, at least I can speak for one of the two examples I'm about to give you. I think one of them was definitely unintended. The second one I, I, I suspect is unintended, but I, I'm not close enough to the issue to, to make that judgment call. But that response to what we, complete, um, we repeatedly are told by the media means that I think that Brexit is definitely an unintended consequence. It's unintended because people fought for it in, in a panic. If you go back to my slide about refugees, the people were led to believe that they were saving the entire world, right? And what if we had told people the truth? What if we had given them the opportunity to hear the full story? Would they have maybe just maybe made different choices and different decisions? I, I kind of suspect so. I really do. Or another unintended consequence. You, you almost can't watch international news to, and not hear this one topic. This one topic about building a wall across, you know, a part of the world to keep some people out. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Because what gets to me more than anything else when I hear this debate about building a wall um, in, in the southern border of the US is that, look, I'm an engineer, and until you present me with real facts and figures, I feel as though you're just selling me your feelings. Or you're selling me a rhetoric that you can't substantiate. And I would love it if more people, I'm not in a position to, to influence it, but more people who, who are would say, well, let's sit down and let's talk about the figures. Let's talk about the real numbers. Let's talk about what has led us to this place with some people feeling as though they need to leave their home. Because I can assure you that nobody wants to leave what's familiar. The majority of human beings, we don't want to leave what's familiar. And if people feel led to do that, there has to be a reason. And we also need to ask ourselves how many people are actually feeling led to do that. But again, like I said, what I'm, I'm, I'm giving you is a picture of what has gone on and what is still going on around us. And how, to some extent, I feel that we allow ourselves or we, we are inadvertently misinformed. Because what these two examples ultimately say is that we don't want to mix anymore. We're not doing this mixing business anymore. That's what effectively those two examples are, they ultimately boil down to. It means that we're saying that, oh, I don't want to have diversity and I don't want to uh, feel as this, particularly the, some of the words we use um, on each other, I don't want to feel like you can feel the things the way I feel. Um, there's your side and there's my side and let's keep it that way. And so then we, we recoil and we say, well, you stay in your place and you, I'll stay in my place. And if there's a problem, there's some people in between who will fix it. And let's leave it to those people. And those people we tend to call this wonderful world, word charity or the United Nations. Do, do many of you know that United, the United Nations has actually outlived its, its um, original um, you know, time creation horizon? It's supposed to be gone by now. 
right? And yet when you live where I live in, in, in Ghana and countries like that, people are still sitting there thinking, oh, there's a plan where somehow we're going to work with the United Nations and things are going to work out. Well, if you've done the same thing for a, a few decades now and um, it hasn't structurally changed, I have a feeling that your solution isn't solution, the solution to the problem you have. Right? It's like saying I've got, a, I've got a stomach ache, but I will keep taking medicine for headaches. It's good medicine. Yeah, sure, it's good medicine for headaches, but it doesn't cure stomach aches. And I think that's what has been proven, that the kind of injustices that we've created are structurally, I can assure you, never going to change un unless we do something differently. I've lived a few decades hope to live a few more, and, you know, more decades. But the point is that in my lifetime, structurally, nothing has changed. So for me, the evidence says the way we're trying to solve the problem is not going to solve the problem. It's very simple, right? And I think there's at least one element I can think of that needs to change. Part of that, my thinking on that particular element, I guess, is led by the fact that I'm a businesswoman. I, I, business is what I understand. But the other way, way I think about, about it is if you go back to my example of, of Coltan, what if we priced Coltan more equitably? Right? Um, there was a story today, or was it yesterday that I was reading it, about, um, was it French milk farmers? Is it French or I think it's French milk farmers who are pouring milk in the streets protesting the low price of milk. Right? What if the DRC said they weren't going to sell any more coltan un until it was the right price? What if we appreciated that the Congolese miner also de deserved a good price that would sustain their livelihood? I'm in a country that has so much coltan and only 80 million people, they should be the richest people on the planet, particularly in the age we live in. So maybe there's also a question of, are we trading equitably with each other? Are we assigning new place, uh, low prices to products from some people because we have branded them as low value, not because the product is low value, but we branded and decided that it's worth less? Because I'm sure that if coltan was from another part of the world, it'd be a lot more expensive, and countries, that country would be a very wealthy country by now. The thing is that I want us to not just think about uh, what has happened. I want us to think in solution mode. And I give you one example of, of equity, which is you know, about trading more equitably. Because as I said, it's what I understand. I want us to stop saying things like, you know, fair trade and, and, you know, making it seem as though we're helping some poor farmer. No, pay the farmer what the farmer is due. Don't undervalue their product and then turn around and say, but I'm doing all these other nice charitable things for them. They don't need charity. I've talked to people who lived with charity. One person said to me, he said, I grew up in a village and, and, um, we had a lot of um, charity, different people came in. And by the way, this young man went on to um, attend UPenn. He's back, back in the States now in medical school. But when he graduated from UPenn, his prize money of $150,000, because he was one of the top kids in his class from this village where he had no electricity, by the way, um, he went back and he built a school for girls in his hometown. And he said to me, I did that because, Lucy, every time somebody showed up in our village and gave us charity, I felt that my dignity was robbed. People are people. And what you and I feel, they feel too. They don't have less feelings just because they don't have um, as much as we have economically. They feel what we feel. And so on the subject of injustice, if there's nothing you remember from tonight, I would love for you to walk away with the word equity. That we have to de be deliberate about it. We have to, in our dealings with each other, in our transactions, and some of you um, young people will go on to be leaders in various fields. If you can just think about equity 
in some of your conversations. I think that would be, you know, a big plus to walk away with today. So why is diversity so such a big thing for us? You know, we know what has happened and we know the structures, but why do we continue to talk about diversity? I think one of the arguments that I, I, I find um, valid is that we've made an assumption of what the standard is. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? If, if I assume that one thing is the standard, everything else that is not like it is diverse. And I need to find ways to plug the other into the standard. But who says that's right? You know, so we always measure um, diversity, almost looking at, at it first from a sort of an Anglo-Saxon kind of view, and I use that term relatively loosely to cover a broad set of uh, metrics, but we use that as the starting point. And then everything else is the diversity we let in. And even when it comes to gender diversity, it's the same thing, because we assume that a certain kind of male in the world is the standard. And so we will allow a few women in and we'll say, you know, we, we, we've been diverse. And it goes on and on. So we start from an assumption that there's a color and a look and a gender for achievement, for ability, and for relevance. <coughs> and interestingly, the standard we, we uh, or most of the world ascribes to is not even the majority. You know, a, ma the majority of people on the planet don't actually look like this standard that we, we, we've all ascribed to. And yet we take it for granted. We don't ask ourselves questions. We just assume that it's a given. But I want us to ask ourselves the questions. I want us to say, well, why is it that way? Why does diversity have to be about um, Lucy showed up so we've got somebody different in the room? Why doesn't it have to be she is another one of us? Because we come in different forms, shapes, and sizes, and looks, and heights, and all these wonderful things that make us, and actually our ability to succeed as human beings has not so much to do with what we look like, but more the kind of opportunity that the world allows us to have. And so I love this quote. Um, again, in an information age, you can't always be 100% sure, but this quote is ascribed to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, sorry, Lincoln. Lincoln, um, um, achievement has no color. I tend to agree. Opportunity has color, but not achievement. And I think when we talk about Anything that we want to fix, it's, it's, it's easy to talk generally, but sometimes we have to narrow it down and look at it. So let me talk a little bit about women, because from a diversity point of view, I mean, there are lots of us women in this room, but it's probably a more, the most relatable um, aspect of diversity because we're half of the world, at least half of the world. Um, so in many countries today, legally, I'm not talking about a loose assumption, legally, Husbands are the head of the household, whether people like it or not, in many countries. Um, women still earn less. Uh, we occupy fewer positions in, in, um, in uh, politics, in parliaments. But I think even more surprisingly is that over half of illiterate people in the world are women. Now, if, we were, if it wasn't an even distribution, it should be only about half. When you say 60%, uh, then suddenly we have a much higher quota of illiteracy um, than people around the world. But it's not all, um, um, all um, when I say people, I mean men and women, sorry. Uh, but it's not, not all doom and gloom when it comes to women, right? So we tell the facts of what we need to address, but then we look at what is happening. And then I burst the bubble a little bit, but we'll get to that. Um, in 2016, 163 million women established businesses. It's a pretty big number. I think the number below, I'll be honest with you, don't worry if it surprises you because it surprised me. Ghana has the highest percentage of um, women-owned businesses in the world. 
But then when you go go back and you think about it, you think it makes sense. Like every Ghanaian woman is doing something. Right? You don't get many Ghanaian women who are like, I will do, I don't have any money and I will do nothing. They will do something. I tell you, even my grandmother, my grandmother would she 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 was always busy working, doing some kind of chore or other. But in the heat of the afternoon, she had this massive tablet, which is probably the size of this, um, the top of this lectern. And she would sit there and she would crack these nuts from the palm kernel and she'd have a bowl be beside her and she'd accumulate them. She's going to take that to market and sell. She was busy. Like she would always do something. So that kind of sounds great. But unfortunately, it's not enough. Because the truth is that progress in female-owned businesses at the moment is insufficiently translating into economic growth. Because like the example I gave of my grandmother, a lot of these women own businesses, all right, but they're owning these businesses for their survival. They're doing things on a very micro scale to get by which means that they don't have you know, access to the right kinds of structures that will ensure that they can have more formalized businesses. They don't have access to the means of growing their businesses. Some of them are not even keeping records of their business. And if you can't grow your business to a point where you, your, your customer base and your access to market um, grows, then your business really doesn't drive um, growth. It helps you survive and maybe your immediate family, but it doesn't drive growth. So we talk about uh, business ownership, and that sort of figure suddenly looks great. But my point is we need to do more than just sit back and assume that that healthy-looking number of 46% suddenly means there's no work to be done. Actually, there's a lot of work to be done. We now need to think consequentially that as we get more women involved in economic activity, what kind of economic activity are they getting involved in, and to what extent and to what end? We have some other figures here on women, women in leadership, women who are in corporate leadership and um, as executive um, business uh, women in the private sector and women in parliament. And again, you see that we still have work to do all over the world. Everywhere we have work to do. So we may look at it one way and say, well, Lucy, at least in many parts of the world, you have at least a I know, quarter of, 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 of seats taken by women, but it's a quarter enough. We're still half of the world. 20 to 25% on average is, not, is simply not good enough. And the interesting thing, when you look at women in leadership in particular, again, we still find buts. What are the buts? The buts are that a lot of the time, these women are not in um, decision-making positions. So this, you know, McKinsey study, and interestingly, I met the, the, the um, partner who led this um, um, study. These are the kinds of things that they found really surprising, um, but then kind of made sense. So in a corporate world, a lot of senior women do not go for the decision-making roles, right, for various reasons. Um, Maybe they're in this you know, support function. They're not in the sort of the PNL, the profit and, and loss ownership or the revenue ownership. They're in the, the, the supporting room, which means that their decision making capability or influence is also um, restricted. And the same goes for women in, in, um, uh, in government, in parliament, particularly in, in uh, many. Um, countries uh, around, I don't think it's only um, in Africa, but I, I guess that's what I'm more familiar with. Women will, are more likely to be uh, minister for gender um, and minister for you know, women and children than to be the minister of finance, right? But economically, we need more women to be the minister of finance if we want women to influence the way we're going. And equally, because the, min the minister of gender still needs funds, but wouldn't it be easier to convince another woman who held the purse strings that we need to invest more in women and children? I suspect it might be. So we still have a lot of work to be done. We face the facts and we look at the figures, but then we have to understand the figures and do, do some work. So about um, four years ago, when I was leading Airtel, something interesting happened. 
And it happened repeatedly. We would go for these business meetings in Ghana, business community um, leadership. We would meet. Um, and it was general. It was both men and women, obviously predominantly male, because not that many companies are, are, are you know, led by women. But there were six of us who we always kind of found each other, six of us women. So the whole thing would happen and we'd have the dinner and the talk and everything. And then the six of us would kind of find each other. And we found ourselves increasingly talking about some of our challenges at work or seeking out ideas and support or where do I find this or where do I do that? Or do you have an example of this situation I'm, find, I'm facing at work? How can I, uh, and I do it? And as that continued to happen over a period, we started to ask ourselves, we asked each other, so we have each other and we can call each other, but what's happening to the women in business and in leadership at various levels in organizations who don't have an us? What do you do when there's nobody to call? Or you don't know anybody to call, you don't have their phone number and their email address. And that got us thinking and we felt that there was a, 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 a course to create an organization that served this particular purpose because it wasn't enough to do for ourselves, right? So when we see challenges, I think it's important that you and I find a way to be part of the solution. And we spent the best part of, oh my goodness, I don't know, maybe 10 months meeting repeatedly um, after work. Sometimes our meetings would go into, you know, late into the night because we were thinking and challenging each other and saying, well, this organization, what will it be about? And who will do what? And what would be the constitution? And how would we support? And who could come and who wouldn't come in? And what level? And it's a lot of work. But we were, we were really driven by the idea that there were women out there who would benefit from what we had. And so after this rather long period, and we did all the legwork ourselves. It wasn't delegated to, I don't know, assistants or number twos at work. We did this work outside of work in our own time, many nights. And I'm so grateful that our families sort of didn't give up on us and say, well, that's enough. You're spending too much time at work and too much time out of work working uh, that we've had enough. And they were very, very kind and supportive. And so um, in 2016, um, in April, we launched the Executive Women Network. And the, with the Executive Women Network, we were very, very clear that we needed women to feel supported. We needed women to be inspired. We wanted them to feel empowered. We wanted them to work together with each other. We wanted them to make an impact nationally and beyond. We wanted to deliberately <coughs> affect those numbers of women in leadership so that we had more to say, more of a say and more of support. And from six women, today we're almost 200 women. Um, and some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them are mid-career, some of them are very senior. But the most interesting thing that happens for me is that you meet these people who are from, so, from such a, a mixed set of backgrounds and life stories, and there's always somebody to learn something for much more than the five people I originally had. I have more women now to lean on and more women to drive support. And what that then does is that it's given us the confidence to have a voice. So a couple of years ago, when the current president of Ghana um, came into power, we asked for a meeting because it's what you do when you get together. And we went to him and we said, well, we want to present this organization to you. Uh, we want to know you to know about us. And first he was really surprised because he didn't know that we existed. And he also was very impressed that we'd gone out of our way to create this. But what he then said was, ah, why don't you all send me your CVs? I want to have a database of these women that we have in Ghana that I can really engage. So that's what we did. And out of that, when they're looking for women to, um, who have influence or have the experience and background, a lot of the time it's one of our women that gets called. And so that's an example of where we can take this whole discussion of diversity, package it, and actually do something about it. Now, we need courage to actually lead. So it takes more than just saying, I want to do something about it. You need to be brave. And 
I want to very quickly tell you a little bit about courage when it comes to this example of um, um, FIFA. Because what happened um, in Ghana last year was that a football-loving country, we suffered and things get, went really pear-shaped and very embarrassing. Um, hope not too many of you um, watched the BBC and got the full detail. I will spare you that. But it was about governance and integrity at the, at the end of the day. And the agreement that was reached and what FIFA did, uh, FIFA is a world governing body for football. Sorry, in case I, I kind of assumed everybody knows, but I just realized that maybe not. Um, they decided that they wanted to bring people with varied backgrounds into the mix to courageously lead. And the reason why I use this example is that it's fresh in my mind. I'm still on the normalization committee. But more importantly, it, it has taken a lot of courage. Because you see, when you start to want to lead and drive change at a national um, level, you will have people who agree with you. Then it's suddenly not like just forming a network of like-minded people. It becomes a discussion of people who feel they have an equal right to disagree with you. And your job as a leader then is to say, do I have the right set of people around me? So with our normalization co committee actually, it's taken the whole discussion about um, um, diversity and what that means to an organization to a whole new level. So the oldest member of our committee is 70, right? And there are two men and there are two women. And there are two lawyers and there are two business people. And there are some people who have you know, football knowledge and there are people like me who respect and love the game and support a team because in my family it is required. Um, but my contribution is more business. But I share this example with you because I want you to be able to courageously say and look at people and say, we're going to, we have a problem we need to solve, but we're going to work across board together and we're going to work with different people. And that's what the whole thing about diversity um, and looking beyond gender and looking at different met metrics brings to the table. So I'm going to wrap up now. I want to talk just very briefly about the change that we really need, because I've set the scene, right? We've looked at some of the injustices. We've looked at how we feel about diversity. We've looked at an example that takes diversity beyond gender. And I want you to look at this. So don't get distracted by the image, because it looks very familiar, but rather the questions. Do we get the leaders we deserve, or do we create the leaders we get? The two questions are not the same, right? We, 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 do, we feel we deserve something. But sometimes we also may create something. And I wonder how many times we question ourselves in that regard, because I feel as though when we look at this particular image and the person it represents, um, I'm sure this room would probably be split down the middle if we had to take sides, but that's not the point. My point rather is that, is this person a fluke? Do the people deserve this person? Or did the people create this person? Is this person actually a representative of leadership, at least where he's from, of our time? You know, it's very, interesting. It's very easy to vilify someone and, or, or you know, go to one extreme or the other. But sometimes I think that when it comes to the leaders who lead us, we need to look a little bit more within. Because let me show you this. Look at this statement. First of all, if I said this, you'd be horrified. Right? If anybody said this, you'd be horrified. You'd be like, in 2019, you can say this? By the way, has, any, has anybody seen this before? It's really shocking. But it's a representation of how we assume we make assumptions. Because actually, this statement was made by a leader that I actually respect. I, have, I, I think he was very strategic. And I quote him in other ways. And I say that, you know, he says we have to make a plan. So you have to make a plan. The plan will change. But I agree with him. Or he said things like, you know, um, um, you never, 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 ever, ever give up. You've, I'm sure some of you have heard when I say that, you start to think of who it is. But this is a leader that this statement is attributed to. I just keep going back to the internet and hoping that, you know, somehow somebody got it wrong. Right? But in his time, he could say this. And many other things, by the way. But 
If he said that in these things in 2019, it would really be a complete disaster for him. I don't think he would survive a day. But in his time, he could make these kinds of statements and, and more. So the question is, was he a creation of his time? Or do you think it's a, a leader just thrust upon people and the people had nothing to do with it? And with the passage of time, this is what's going to keep happening to us. Because even you and I, there are things that we might say today that in 10 years' time, we, we wouldn't want attributed to us. And I think we now need to think about leadership a lot more deliberately than assuming that it is what it is. Because the truth of the matter is that I believe that we have a hand in the creation of those leaders. Because what a leader is able to do is what we accept. So we're not in a world where we can completely just remove ourselves and assume we had nothing to do with it. We are part of it. And so I implore you to see opportunity as leaders, opportunity to create a different world for every single human being. I think that's the change we need. The change where all these things that I suggest here, good policies, um, ultimately a more um, equitable global economic um, structure or structures around us, is really about us being leaders who do one very simple thing for every human being. And that is to lead for good. I think we can. We just have to choose to. It doesn't happen um, as just a matter of course because our history has brought us where we are. But if we choose deliberately, I think we can lead for good. And what I implore you tonight, and thanking you very much for your time, is that we should try hard to fix it together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very uh, powerful lecture. Um, I, mean, I think there's a lot of food for thought. Uh, I think your choice of your last message, I think, is a very powerful and, and positive one. Um, leading for good, I think, is a, a really nice place to, uh, to hang it. Um, before we move to the next part, I just want to also highlight one thing from yes. your talk, which I think is also very important, given that we're in a university setting, and it's at the beginning about the importance of evidence base in making decisions in leadership and uh, and from a polit political perspective, yeah. and this is where you, as students at McGill, uh, you know this amazing university with all these wonderful research uh, opportunities and resources, um, make sure that you bring that evidence base uh, to to bear in the public discourse. Um, anyways, so now um, moving to the next um, part, I'd like to introduce also um, Professor of Practice at the Institute for the Study of International Development, Eliane Ubelijoro, uh, who is also um, a leader, who is also a very strong advocate um, on matters around gender and diversity, and also a background in STEM. And so uh, Eliane is going to lead us through a fireside chat um, for the next uh, 15 or so minutes, um, and taking in some of the questions that I know that Professor Kazue Takamura was able to glean from INTD 200 students. So um, you will be able to get some answers to those questions. And then after that, we'll open it up for a general Q&A. So I leave it now to Eliane and Lucy to take us through to the next uh, phase of the talk. Thank you. So thank you very much, Lucy, for a very, very um, interesting talk. And um, you left us with a lot to think about. And the idea of leading for good. And, and I'm just going to um, challenge you here. Why lead for good? Um... Because I think that the evidence, again, back to evidence, is that we have deliberately created what we, we, we live with today as a world. And there was a time when it didn't matter so much because um, someone else's quote unquote problem was not necessarily a global problem. 
fortunately, and I think I use the word fortunately um, um, deliberately, fortunately, we now live in a world where we cannot absolve ourselves or remove ourselves from other people's problems, which means that if we don't live for good, that's, which is a common good, our own um, um, you know, way of life suddenly becomes awkward and you know, there are things that we have to um, live without. So I'll give you a very um, simple example that uh, when people talk about Brexit now, the, the other side headline is about people already hoarding stuff because they've forgotten that actually it does not just keeping people out, it will start to keep goods and services out. So we need to think more broadly now about this general global good, um, because good for someone else, I think now is really good for us too. One of the challenges I have, uh, so one of the things that comes up just hearing your talk is, so there's about 60 people in the US who own the same amount of wealth as half of the population, around 160 million mm -hmm. people. And so if you, if you actually go globally, there's you know, a couple of hundred people who own half the wealth of the planet. Many of those work in areas where data is really important mm -hmm. and whoever hoards the data has power yes. and has wealth. And the decisions in terms of whether we talk about Brexit, the wall or um, extreme, um, right groups mm -hmm. and nationalism happening around the world, what is the data we are offered? What is the data that comes to the surface versus the data that we really need to make the decisions for leadership for good? And so I, I'm challenged by the fact that the average person doesn't have access to the data that's needed mm -hmm. to make the right decisions. And so how do we, talking to, to young people in university who have access to a lot of knowledge, how do, how do we encourage young people to mobilize that knowledge? Um, I think because, by definition, being young and particularly being a student, it's a great time of your life. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, you do have access, by definition, to more, info, more sources of information. You're, you're, you're fortunately not only dependent on places like the internet, you have many sources, but it's about the willingness and the desire to seek out that data. And I think in our, our general speak and, and when we engage each other, we need to challenge each other. When someone says something to me, the first thing I ask is, okay, based on what? That's not to say I'm, I'm assuming the, the, what the person is saying is untrue, but I want to walk, I don't want to repeat it and just repeat it because it was your feelings. I want to repeat it based on facts so that I'm passing on useful information. So I think young people really need to go out of their way and, and seek out information. They are the future. Um, the reason why I even spend the time in, in, in you know, um, meetings like this is because of the young people. I'm really here because of the young people, not because I have some you know, fancy ideas that I just feel like sharing, but I feel that we owe the young people, younger people this sort of transmission you pass on a, a, a different foundation than perhaps we, most of us grew up with, which made some of the assumptions that I, sh I showed earlier, they were assumptions and we thought that was real until we sought out the data and we realized that, okay, there's more to this story. So we must encourage them. We must make sure that our speech and our, t uh, you know, what we engage in is different. And I'm hoping that with current pressure, um, the media will also learn to you know, start projecting more information that is fact-based than just sort of a, a opinion and conjecture. But Eliane, that point you made about wealth, just two quick things. One is, I think it's not just about the extremes of wealth and the few people who can control massive amounts of wealth. When you talk about equity, actually it's more than just those people. And we all equally need to find our place because then if you bring it down to, I don't know, the top 10%, some people, more people, and then the top 50, and suddenly, and I, I like to say this to, to my family, that actually, if you have you know, uh, parents who have a degree, who have this certain metrics, you're still in the top group of human beings, regardless. And the other point I wanted to make is that I love what Jack Ma said about extreme wealth. Um, he, he said many things, but one of the things he said is that if you come up with an idea and a solution for human beings, and by, 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 having, by owning the solution, you are able to amass so much wealth, in his opinion, you're a custodian of that wealth. It doesn't belong to you. And you have a job and a responsibility to figure out how to redistribute it for the benefit of more human beings. And I love that. 
I love that. I think uh, there's nothing wrong with people um, becoming wealthy appropriately in the right, in the right, uh, through the right means, but then the responsibility is that there's a much bigger world out there. So one of the things ab about that is I, I think there, there's data showing that the majority of billionaires give maybe two, three percent of their wealth away. So, so they're still keeping a lot yes. for themselves. And, you know, if they do it to build businesses that hire more diverse people so that we actually uh, have more solutions to the challenges we're facing, that's great. But if it's not, then we're that's back to the problem. Exactly. And so it was interesting, the data you were showing around um, women business owners in, in um, Ghana. Ghana, but as well, the fact that most women go into business for survival. How do we change that? Well, the question is, why are they in this position in the first place, right? Um, and one example is what I mentioned, which was about equitable trade, right? Because a lot of these women are involved in business. Why do they want to survive? Why do they need to survive? Because they're economically disadvantaged. But then what makes their situation even worse is that even when they go into business, what they produce is undervalued. Right, and when we undervalue what they, 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 the service or the goods they provide, then we keep them there. Because it's one thing to say, um, this businesswoman doesn't have the structures, but she can't afford the structures to formalize her business. And it's chicken and egg. So she's stuck in this vicious cycle of being on a small scale, um, doing, running a small business, and we keep giving her pittance for her, her day's work. So it just keeps on. And that's what we need to change. We need to... Um, attribute more value to their contribution. So one of the challenges I have around that, so um, I have a, a friend uh, who's, a, who's a lawyer, and, and, and one of the things he told me is, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So at the end of the day, if I don't feel that I have value, the probability that I will get the value I deserve is very low. And so it's very, it's a great idea to say, oh, you know, let's get them what they deserve. But how do we get them to value themselves to a point where they will actually be the transformative agents? So I take in a deep breath because for me, that um, subject is actually far deeper than anything we've discussed today. Um, I live in a continent where I believe that many people have fundamentally accepted that they're not deserving of equity, right? Including these women. So these, the, 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 the women are just one example, but I just find that um, I have a lot of people around me who have absorbed inherited inferiority. And it sound, now it sounds very harsh, and now I'm stepping away from the data, but I'm talking now life experience. Um, so for lots of these women, they don't actually feel deserving. And, and the, the more we continue to communicate, um, and that's why I always use that example of things like charity, or organization like charity, the more we continue to communicate about how disadvantaged they are and, and how fortunate they are to get somebody to give them a pittance and, and the indignity that, that, that comes with that means that we, we actually are keeping them there. We're not, we're not helping them psychologically um, by being charitable. What they need is for us to suddenly pick up our boots, uh, you know, to not pick up boots, but uh, say that what you are doing is worth something. So I hate to say this, but this is, for me, a very complicated issue. For me, it's extremely complicated because the fact that I show up and I tell you that you're worth something doesn't mean that you're going to believe me. I do think that policy and decision makers can influence that. And that's where the conversation about leadership for good now comes into it. Because these women don't have negotiating power and they don't feel great about themselves. So they're not going to suddenly develop it. But if we as leaders suddenly say, actually, instead of you going out and negotiating for your $50 business on your own, I'm actually going to pull you together and I'm going to be your voice and I'm going to speak for all thousand of you and I'm going to negotiate for you. For me, that's what leadership does to change the agenda. But that requires a certain type of leadership. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit what kind of leadership that requires? What's the secret sauce in terms <laughs> of that type of leadership? Um, 
There isn't a unique secret sauce, if you ask me. Um, and I go back to the conversation um, on, about change um, on the African continent, and even that really clearly demonstrates that there isn't one secret source. Um, if I talk about it at a, at a national level, each country has had its own um, history and experiences. And as much as people try to muddy it and make it all sound the same, it's, it's not, right? Um, if you take a country that perhaps has a, 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 a experienced losing a lot of its population through any form of, you know, like you take the example of Rwanda, that's a very different kind of leadership that is required to hold it together and to, to come to the, the, to the table than a country where maybe their experiences have been softer or not as harsh, so it's a different kind of leadership. But I think what all those leaders have in common is that they, you do need to be a courageous leader, especially if you're representing the disadvantaged. Because again, like I said, it's structural. So you're suddenly asking people to accept the possibility of a different structure. So one, you have to be courageous. Um, two, of course, you have to be ethical um, and authentic. But, but more importantly, you have to be willing to think beyond now. Because a lot of the time when you're in a leadership position, there's this immediate instinct to uh, self-preservation. And what I'm going to do is it has to sound good and has to be you know, um, in the here and now. Uh, but if you can look beyond, it reinforces your courage. So two very specific examples. Um, you know, when, when Rwanda said no to secondhand clothing from the US, there wasn't so much uproar. But the, my question is, how is the clothing and textile industry in Rwanda going to develop if they keep accepting secondhand clothing? You know, so there's no point trying to bully them if we think we're trying to be good people. They don't need secondhand clothes to grow economically. They need an industry that serves their people. You know, and that took a lot of courage. And it's still, you know, the president, it's still, president Kagame is still standing on it. And, you know, good, kudos to him for the courage. Um, another example is president of Ghana, um, where I'm from. And this one, you know, completely continues to astound me. So he gave a long speech um, in, uh, when he had an audience with um, President Macron from France, and that's when he announced Ghana Beyond Aid. And suddenly, you look at the media reaction you know, one reaction that surprised me, that you, normally the media in France doesn't talk a lot about English-speaking Africa, and even they carried this story. They were horrified. Because the response was almost like, this guy is talking out of wherever. How, what does he think that this African country is ever going to be in a position where they don't need aid? And I sat back and I thought, oh my goodness. We're actually having a conversation where you're telling me that you want me to be better off, but you don't actually want me to do well. That when I tell you courageously that I can get to a point that I don't have to beg you any longer, you turn around and you say to me, oh, Lucy, come on, that's a dream. But both of those statements that were made were courage that goes beyond the generation. Because living, living beyond aid is not going to happen tomorrow. But it's that call that says, people, let's pull up our, our, you know, roll up our sleeves and let's work together to make this happen. And I would love for us around the world, when I say let's do it together, to say that actually we can get countries and these people and these women to a place where they live equitably and decently like every human being. So, okay. Um, so Africa's population is around 1.2 today. Mm -hmm. If conditions stay the same, we'll be four billion by the next century. Yes, before <laughs> apparently. So, so, what what role can women and girls play? Um, um, when you say, are you talking specifically about population growth or economic outcomes? <laughs> okay, well. Look, women and girls, we're half of the population. So first of all, we need to be empowered ourselves, right? So the first thing is about our, our ability to have the ambitions and the desires and the opportunities to self-actualize. So for me, it starts with us first. Let's create opportunities for every girl and subsequently, consequently every woman um, to self-actualize. Because when you're in a place where you're not thinking about your next meal, then you can now start to make meaningful contribution. And I think that's the second step. We need to 
get our place, uh, our, our seats at the table. We need to be part of the decision makers. We have to be willing to do the work that is required to become a decision maker and start to sway and balance the outcomes. Because whether the, the booming population, as one example, is good or bad, we still kind of have a, a, a bit of control over that. And if we can decide what's right in terms of outcomes, then we can influence that. So self-actualize and influence, um, influence our societies. Thank you very much, Lucy. You're welcome. So this has been really great. And um, what you said about around value is, is something that really is close to my heart. In, in, in Rwanda, we have something called Agachiro, which mm -hmm. is really, I have value. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, it's a whole campaign around the country and everybody from kindergartners Courageous you know, to grandparents, it's all about how do we value ourselves? And, and it starts from there. And, yeah. and I really appreciate that you talked about that. And so I'd just like to open it up for questions. And so there are two microphones. And it, because this event is being recorded, um, please go to the microphones if you have questions. If you, if you just stand up in the middle, I'm not going to take your question. So, so please uh, just give us your name and, and go to a microphone. And, uh, and please keep the questions short. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for the lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm from the old school, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to see all the students here. Uh, I spent it, uh, uh, 10 years at McGill, so I know the, I know the jazz. Um, I, I, at the beginning of your speech, I'm a, I'm a mining engineer by training. At the beginning of your speech, you talked a lot about mining. And I was so glad because I looked at it and I said, I must know something about that. Well, I remember when copper price uh, was t uh, t 25, 50 cents a pound. And it was all coming from Africa. And for 50 years after the Second World War, it never went up because America was buying all the copper and that was the only customers the Africans had. And I felt so confused. Now I understand, you know, they, they obviously exploited them. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had to build a America. Now, the question I have is about uh, uh, your, uh, your, your coal, coal tan? Yeah, coal tan. Now, I'm, I, I thought I would know a little bit about minerals. What is coal tan? Um, it's a mineral that's used in um, batteries. So the kind of batteries that support our smart devices, yes. whether it's a phone or a, a battery for a smart car, um, which is set to grow hundreds of percentage um, points in the next few years, it, it is, it's actually used in those. But what, 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 is it mined or? It's mined, it's mined. And is it in a periodic the, table? Um, I've not seen it. A coltan is, um, um, it's a combination of two elements, and, and I'm sure we can we, we can Google it. But we it could is, look it, it up. Is in the it, 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 it is. Okay. Let's um, just keep uh, keep element. it in terms yeah. of uh, the international. Yeah. No, but I think question. he has a, a question. It's, it's a, you want to know whether coltan is a real mineral? Yes. And, I, and the answer is yes. yes. It's a combination it, it, of two it's, minerals it's mined, mined in okay. the DRC it's used mined. in batteries. Yes. I, I thank you. You're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. As I'll try and speak louder. So thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question around the notion of equitable. Mm -hmm. um, when you spoke about it, I had the same sort of discomfort as uh, the professor raised in the sense that who is going to define what is equitable and who is going to be the voice at the table that's going to negotiate that equity. And I, and I understand how you reframed it to say, OK, we need to have allies. But who are those allies and how do they get a voice that is strong enough and that is um, considered credible enough that they are at the right, tab at the right negotiation tables um, that they can then create equitable um, situations? Because equity is the definition of equity is from the person who has the most strength at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you're absolutely right. And that's why the last part of my um, um, lecture that focused on leadership is, is so important because you and I may not always have this, uh, a seat at the right table, but if we have sufficiently influenced who ends up representing us, then hopefully that person thinks at least to some extent like we do. And if we remove ourselves from that responsibility, then we're allowing anybody else 
to be in charge and to make that call. So one is us taking the responsibility to influence who ends up in, in leadership positions. Um, two is about sharing the facts and figures so that someone else who's representing another group of people has the same information that we have and it's not you know, um, 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 emotional. But then we have to go this other level of wanting every human being to have to, to, to have the good that we all, we all deserve. Um, so the definition of equitable may not be equal around the world. Um, but I use equitable because what's good for me may not be good for you necessarily. Um, so let me give a very specific example. We live in different countries with different climatic conditions, right? So what is equitable for somebody living in beautiful Montreal where a lot of the time it's so freezing cold, and this is really a really simple example, is not necessarily what would be right for me living in Accra, right? But ultimately, if we define that whether you live in Montreal or you, you live in Accra, what's equitable is to say you live in a de decent building, you don't have to worry about your meals. You don't have to worry about whether your children will get, get an education or not. Um, you don't have to worry about your health care. Certain basic definitions, then we can agree on those. And then how we manifest and deliver the equity, the form of it, may vary. Does that sort of paint the picture? So that's why I use the word, I tend to say equitable instead of equal, because we don't need the same things. I need what's right for me, and you need what's right for you. So leadership and, and clearly defining what is equitable. Thank, thank you for the lecture. Um, I just have a kind of a question and, and also an input. Mm -hmm. um, it's regarding that most of the equity, I, I believe personally, it has to do with options. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have another option, for example, if you live here in Montreal in um, North America, uh, you have an option to pursue a... Um, another career or another um, business and get some sort of support uh, in terms of development support and banking. Mm -hmm. And what I see across Africa, per se, um, is just no banking. It's not serious banking. So in reality, is there's the logistics of achieving a goal. And there's, like, there's the ideology and then there's the logistics of it. And I think it has a lot to do with having options for equity. If you have an option, you can negotiate. You can, you can go for the long run. You can go 24 months, five years to negotiate your price. But if you don't have an option, you have to take the offer in the table. And I think it has a lot to do with similar to negotiation and laws. So the, the finance associated with that, I think it's not an understatement. I think it's the fundamentals of that. Can I ask so. you a question? Sure. How many African countries have you visited? Five countries. Okay. How many oh. countries are in Africa? These 55 countries. Okay. So that's a, the reason why I asked the question is that I think we, we have to be wary of making broad brush assumptions and be specific. So when you say banking is non-existent in, in, in Africa, for instance, it depends on the country you went to, the countries you went to. The volume, I mean, of it. Well, even the volume. So here's, here's why this conversation we're having today is so important. The gentleman here actually made a very important um, observation, um, and he reinforced some of what he, I said. Thank you very much. Because, again, copper was mined for 50 years and undervalued, right? Yes. So we left the people poor, and we let them hand over to the next generation poor, and again, now we're mining coltan or the, all these other things, and we're still leaving them poor. And if we don't deliberately do anything, the next generation will be poor. Point of my lecture. So when we make sweeping assumptions that um, people don't have op options, we, which may be right, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you, 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 there isn't truth in that. I said 58% of um, sub-Saharan, so of Africans were dimensionally poor. We need to peel the onion and say, but why? If for 50 years, copper was mined to build an entire continent, why should the source of copper still be poor? If Coltan is now supporting, um, a, and when I say a trillion dollar Apple business, that's just one of the device manufacturers, and they all use the Coltan, just one example. If it's supporting an industry that's many trillion dollars over, how is the source poor? 
So the question we, we should be asking ourselves, are these structural injustices, which seem to be going from one generation to the, ne to the next, which is why I started my lecture there, we need to start to now take a step back and say, actually, how do we change the structure? They don't have options. They don't have opportunity. Tick, 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 you're, you're right. But why don't they have it is the question we should be asking. Not the statement of they don't have, but why? And then address the why. That's true. Yeah, I, I, the answer I actually I got uh, a lot now is uh, long-term financing has a lot to do with risk and de-risking projects and de-risking initiatives like that. That seems to be one of the highest priority for any institution lending. Uh, so how do we control risk, especially on uh, uh, new projects, projects that are not validated? And it's also the schema of most of the banking is that they just deal with risk, right? So uh, that's how they invest on the long run. And I think that's, that's the issue too. It, it has to do with risk. And I, I see how it goes Africa into governance. Africa isn't riskier. Africa, I knew where you were going when yeah. you, you said that Africa isn't riskier. Majority of African countries are democracies, right? Majority of whatever fighting you hear of, of the 54 countries, is in a handful of places, just like it is anywhere in the world. The perception of risk is high. And I'd love to catch up with you after this, because I know people have other questions. But honestly, this is something I have spent a lot of time discussing and debating. And I can give you a lot of um, credible insight. Uh, but yes. I appreciate your question and input. Thank you. So uh, great and round perception of risks. One of the things I'd just like to add, the like copper. Uh, 90, so 1% so of the, the impurities of the copper were gold. And in some cases, they're making more money off That's of the gold. impurities than the copper itself. So STEM, the importance of STEM yes. and involving women, is something just we need to keep yeah. that in mind is, is how do we ensure that we're building knowledge economies because that's where the wealth creation Absolutely. and the perception will change exactly. the risk. Okay, last question, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it was a nice talk. And uh, one thing that was very clear from your talk was how um, the structures that we have tend to reinforce themselves over generations and, and so on and so forth. And because of that, we find ourselves in this vicious cycle where we can break out. I have a little bit of a more practical, like, you know, I um, want to like, get from you a pragmatic approach to, uh, you know, how we can, you know, navigate ourselves out of this. So, when you talked about aid, for example, and the fact that um, uh, some countries want to break out of this chain, uh, well, it so happens that um, organizations like the United Nations and other, and other um, uh, if you like, um, some of these uh, uh, organizations like to perpetuate themselves, okay? So you have a situation where there is absolutely no reason why they have to be on the ground doing what they are doing. And it's been proven that like, if you give people space, they'll look for alternatives. Yes. But then, like, uh, from, uh, and I'm, I'm talking because I used to work with the UNDP, and these are some of the reasons why you know, you know, I got out of the organization. And when you start asking questions about when do we stop, then it's like, oh, well, look at the people on the ground. Is there, is there is a little girl, like, you know, does he have food? That, do they have food? Do they have schools and stuff like that? So my question is, uh, are there, you know, this courageous level of leadership that's going to push us out of this vicious cycle? What should, you know, uh, leaders like the president of Ghana and other places who are courageous, you know, supposed to be courageous, you know, what, how should they approach looking at, the suffering of people like uh, who are marginalized and who need these last mile, you know, economic solutions, and you know, walking away from some of these interventions that could help in order to break out of the chain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. The, look, that question is multifaceted. We could write a whole speech about it. I think the number one thing that, uh, particularly people who live in disadvantaged parts of the world, need is a breakaway uh, from perception. Because the perception isn't just what other people think of them, it's what they think of themselves. And what they think of themselves is actually the bigger problem in my mind. Because like the example we use, you're not going to negotiate if you think you're worth less. Your goods are also worthless. And if I give you one extreme example, and focusing on Africa, because obviously that's what I know um, best, um, the biggest marketing campaign for Africa, if I asked anybody, um, if you took a step back and you thought for a second, you'd all have the same example. 
And it's an example that's not controlled by Africans. The biggest marketing campaign for Africa is um, charities. Right? They own the African brand. And they perpetuate the high risk levels, the disease, the this, the this. They don't talk about anything great. And once they pers th th this persistent message, which is on everybody's TV screen in the, in the Western world, look, for some people, that's the only thing they've ever seen or heard of Africa. That's your brand. The person isn't wrong for assuming that's who you are. That's what they've been told you are forever. Right. And so for me, that is an example of one thing that really needs to be addressed. That I think that African countries need to come together and say, enough, you're not going to run your charity off of my back. Do you know the number of times I'm infuriated when they say, oh, this is Ama. She lives in a village somewhere in, 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 in northern Ghana. She's probably going to be married by the time she's 12. Except I've never actually met any of these girls. I don't know. I'm not saying none of them exist. Right. But they're child brides in the USA as well. Right? So, but no one's going to brand the US as a country of child brides. Why don't you suddenly rebrand it and say, this is Lucy. She's from Ghana. There are 10 other Lucys in there. And actually, there are 100 other women who are far better than this woman, and so on and so forth. So, we have that honest work that we need to do to say, enough. You can't keep saying these things about me and get away with it. Let me tell my own story. It's what I said in the beginning don't tell my story for me. Thank you very much, Lucy. This was really insightful. Thank you for taking Thank the time, coming all the way from Ghana to Montreal and you know, experiencing the snowstorm <laughs> with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it.